Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. And thanks to all of you for joining us here today. I'd like to welcome you to this year's FutureView 2015 live webinar, which is our annual look ahead at major marketplace dynamics that we believe will shape the future. So before we get started, a few uh, quick preliminaries. First of all, uh, if you're seeing a little green uh, panel at the top of your screen, just ignore it. I'm sharing my screen for this webinar, and there's no way to hide this panel. So no big deal. Uh, it'll just uh, be there, but it won't get in the way. Second, uh, I expect that, as usual, I will take up most of our time today. So we really won't have time for Q&A at the end. But your account rep, or really uh, anyone at the Futures Company, including me, is happy to follow up. Third, we're going to be live tweeting this webinar, and I would encourage you to do the same. The hashtag, as you see down at the bottom, is Uber All Economy. And the Twitter handles for both me and the Futures Company are shown in the bottom rail as well. And finally, uh, if you'd like a hard copy of this deck or a replay link, uh, you can find it later today at the link here that's on the bottom left. And again, uh, thanks for your uh, time today. So on to our topic, uh, the Uberall economy, and the opportunity that it offers to your businesses and, and, and the ability to carry you to the peak or to the vertex, as we say here, of value growth in the years ahead. Now, as you know, since we began FutureView Live in 2001, we have covered many dynamics that have proven to be very important. And just to mention a few, in 2006 it was disownership, uh, an idea that foreshadowed the subsequent explosion of the sharing economy in peer-to-peer. -peer. In 2010 it was contentment and the emergence of happiness as a major market force. In 2011, it was the kinship economy and the new marketing model demanded by social media. And last year, as you may remember, it was the pivot to passive digital and the next wave of technology. In fact, we'll touch on this topic again today as we dig into the transformative impact of Uber All. So what do we mean by the Uber All economy? Are we really defending Uber against all of its recent negative publicity? Well, no, we're not. In fact, today is not about those controversies. In fact, to be honest, today is only peripherally about Uber itself. We'll talk a little bit about Uber, but today is more about a business model revolution that is turning every category upside down. Uber is just the most famous example because to date it is the most successful pioneer. Indeed, this is a business model revolution that is rooted in digital reengineering of the value model in all categories based upon service, not product innovation, that opens affordability to the hollowed out middle class while showing the way to a new vein of premium opportunities in an otherwise struggling consumer economy. Now to talk about this, I want to explore Uberall in the following way. First, we need to establish context. The global economy, quite frankly, offers poor prospects for doing business in the same old ways. So something new is needed. And that something new is the Uber-style business model. So second, we'll see that the impact and potential of Uberall is apparent already. Third, we'll ask ourselves the question of, what this business model really consists of and what it might take for your brands to follow suit. We will ask then next what makes Uberall such a tight fit for every aspect of what people want and what people can afford. And finally, we'll pose the question of what you should be doing next, what you should be thinking about as you face forward into this future. But to begin with, let's establish some broader context and start with the global economy and the rough ride that we've been on of late. Simply put, the global economy is not running on all cylinders. The view expressed by the IMF in its latest World Economic Outlook is illustrative of the consensus. Global growth is slowing. The IMF itself has lowered both its 2014 and 2015 forecast in the face of significant risk. Developed economies are largely stagnant, and emerging economies are well off their fervid pace of years past. Remember, Russia is now in a recession. 
The EU has barely dodged one. China has slipped below its demographic break-even growth rate of 8%. Argentina is in default. Japan's restart turned out to be a false start that has fizzled. And Brazil is in trouble on all fronts, with no growth expected this year. Of course, there's more, but let me just stop with all the depressing news there. A similarly gloomy outlook is heard from Bart Van Ark, chief economist at the conference board. In a little one-minute video that he released on YouTube, he noted that 2015 is not really going to improve much beyond what we've seen over the last few years, with geopolitical uncertainty translating into quote-unquote pessimism about the year. And this will continue to play out through at least 2025. And just to put an exclamation point on it, Van Ark reminds us that 3% growth is simply not enough to measure up to the challenges ahead in the 21st century. And it's not just the global economy, it's the U.S. economy, too. Despite improvement and some recent good news, the U.S. economy is running slow as well. Now this, as I call it, this chart of many numbers that you see here, simply shows the declining optimism of economists as this year has progressed. Every time the Federal Reserve has met to make policy decisions from March to June to September, the assembled economists have lowered their growth projections over every time frame. As a recently published Fed study has reported to big headlines in places like the Wall Street Journal, severe downturns in years past have permanently depressed economic output. That is to say, when you fall into the kind of hole we just fell into, History shows that you never climb all the way out. The trend line up is always below where it was before. In other words, the economy just resets at a lower level. And this is the worry behind the recent debate about secular stagnation and economic output gaps. What you see here is a chart showing the decline and recovery of U.S. GDP versus a trend line above it extrapolated from before the Great Recession. It's a gap of a little under $900 billion, or about 5% of last year's GDP. This trend line at the top, this potential GDP, represents capacity that we have, labors, factory shipping, that is underutilized today to the tune of about $900 billion. We have the capacity to produce more, but there is not enough demand in the economy to do so. In other words, it's just a very simple case of too much supply and too little demand. And that means deflationary pressure on prices and wages, which is exactly what we've been seeing. If you want to know why your company can't grow its revenue like before, even as perhaps your unit sales are on a torrid pace, this is the reason. Downward pressure on pricing growth because of an output gap in the broader macro economy. Now, a few years ago, the Washington Post looked at what it would take to close the U.S. output gap. At 6% growth post-recession, it actually would have closed by now. At 3% growth, it will take until at least 2020, but we haven't been experiencing 3% growth. At 2% growth, which is more in line with long-term forecasts in our recent experience, it never closes. We never get back to the pre-recession trend line. The economy just resets at a much lower level. It grows, but it resets at a lower level. And that's what we're facing. Now, having said all that, I'm sure I can read your minds and you're saying, but wait, we just had a great jobs report. And the stock market liked it. And indeed, the stock market should like it. The economy is growing, just at a lower level. The economy is growing, and equities, of course, are priced on growth. But the recent jobs report, and the question we should ask about it, is not whether or not it was a good report. It's a question of whether or not it was good enough to signal a return to the pre-recession trend line, or in other words, to close the output gap. And while the November jobs report was good, it wasn't that good. And indeed, as conservative economist Michael Strain at the American Enterprise Institute tweeted that day, the good news in that report comes with several caveats that he lists here. Most important, perhaps, is what liberal economists always focus on, and that's wage growth. And, of course, this is equally important to business leaders. It's important to us. 
And on this front, the November jobs report shows no improvement whatsoever. Wages continue to be stagnant, with only sluggish growth since the beginning of the Great Recession. So with wages stagnant, consumers are struggling. We saw this in the recent disappointment in our Black Friday weekend. In fact, census tracking of retail sales and spending over the last few years shows a downward trend of year-over-year -year growth. In recent years, growth levels are well below those dating back to the mid-1990s. Again, there is growth, just not strong growth. The economy is running slow. The old way of doing business depends on an economy that no longer exists. Our business models were formed in an economy that was on a different trend line. The economy is not operating like it used to. And so for the near term, at least, if not longer, the economy has reset. While growth is occurring, it is on a lower trend line. And this is taking a toll. Headlines tell the tale. P&G, Unilever, Walmart all reporting difficulties and cautious outlooks. And more likely than not, this is your business too. So what's the takeaway from all this gloom and doom? And I promise you the gloom and doom is over now. <laughs> As I said, the old ways are underpowered. They're just facing headwinds that are too strong for them. And it's seen in weakening growth, growing but not as strong as we used to. As a result, consumers are struggling. They're not seeing improvement in their household finances. The economy has put them behind the eight ball, so they can't spend like they used to. So what's needed is not trying to run faster on the old path, but running in a new direction, a different model, one that better fits what consumers can actually afford and one that offers more of what consumers truly value today. One that can turn the new trend line into a strong new trajectory. So what's the better match? Well, yep, you guessed it. It's the uber -all business model. And that takes us to the one place in the market that is growing exponentially. <clears throat> now, as I said, Today is not so much about Uber as it is about the Uber business model. But one way to calibrate the business model is to look at Uber and Uber's success. And this chart shows Uber's current market cap based on its last round of fundraising. Today, Uber is worth more than Delta Airlines, and in fact, more than Tesla, another heart startup. It's worth more than LinkedIn, part of the social media royalty. It's half as valuable as McDonald's, and it's getting closer to General Motors. Admittedly, this is far from Apple's march to a trillion dollar valuation, but it's not peanuts either. In fact, Uber's market cap has more than doubled in value since June. Uber is red hot, even in our tepid economy. And it's not only Uber. It's anything and everything that is based on an Uber-like business model. Uber is just the poster child for this business model, which is powering every startup you see in this slide, taken from a SlideShare presentation posted by Steve Schlafman, who is one of the principals at New York City VC firm RRE Ventures. There are a lot of companies shown here, but in truth, this is just a smattering of everything that's going on. In fact, investors are clamoring to put money into the Uber all economy. Now later, I'm going to talk about adding some of these elements to your businesses or brands. But for now, suffice it to say that this is where you are most at risk. These startups are your biggest competitors, your biggest threats. They may not look like your products or your current competition, but believe me, they are coming at you. Again, Uber exemplifies this. Uber competes with taxis right now, but its ambitions are much, much bigger. It wants to compete with auto companies. It wants to compete with logistics firms. 
It wants to compete with delivery services. It is a new model that gives it a platform to compete with anything that has to do with transportation. For that matter, it will even affect housing, home building, which after all is a business founded on a grid that has a certain transportation network embedded into it. Somehow you got to drive home. But once Uber changes the profitability of that network, all bets are off. And believe me, I mean every category. Let's just pick one for the sake of discussion. Let's say laundry detergent. The competitive set is not just Tide versus Purex, for example. It's Fly Cleaners, too, which, like Uber, operates on demand with a mobile app. You see their trucks lined up here. Obviously, now, Fly Cleaners is not a direct substitute product, but it is a substitute for the same benefit, which is clean clothes when you need them. The biggest of these to date are Fly Cleaners and Washio, but there are others like Rinse and Drive that are coming on strong. And as these firms get experience, and as competition between them drives down their own pricing, they will have an impact on traditional brands in established categories, you know, like Tide and Purex. In a sluggish global economy, marginal share matters. So overall competitors can't be dismissed merely because of their smaller size and scale today. Indeed, every category is being scrutinized for overall potential. One survey of investors and experts foresees grocery products and retail, grocery retail, home services, and events and entertainment as the next wave of categories most likely to follow the first wave of restaurants, transportation, and hospitality. Now, of course, established companies are alert to the Uber all economy. American Express has teamed with Uber for a joint rewards program. This is very interesting and it's innovative, but it is far from enough. The future demands a more aggressive assessment of threats and opportunities. Recently, the New York Times Upshot team looked at the impact of Uber on the value of New York City taxi medallions. After decades of steady increases, their value has flattened out, with signs now of slumping. The November update to this trend line shows a continuing drop in value. In fact, in this upshot story, one owner of a medallion company was quoted as saying that he is resigned to the inevitability of going bankrupt. And this is due in New York City to the impact of Uber at the margins. That's the minimum threat, although Uber all could be an even bigger threat. In San Francisco, where it all got started and where all of these Uber all economies are running rampant, cab rides are down 65%, two-thirds, since January 2012. There is a lot to learn uh, about the Uber business model and a lot to learn from it. At least that's what the Boloco Burritos chain founder, John Pepper, said when he was asked why he became a part-time Uber driver after he left his startup company. He took it up, he says, because he believes that Uber-like business models, as you see here at the bottom, are going to remake restaurant and retail. In fact, we agree, and we think it's more categories than just those. So what's the takeaway from all of this liftoff Uber all? Well, first of all, Uber all is clearly the way to grow in the current economy. It's a powerhouse model. It is, I dare say, the new motive force in the marketplace with explosive growth opportunities, even in our current economy. Take note, investors want your customers. They want your customers to do business with their startups. They want your customers to get the benefit you provide them through their startups. They want your customers to come to a new business model. So at the very least, this is a competitive threat that you need to better understand. 
But either way, threat or opportunity, it matters to you because there is upside here for your business. And let's take a closer look at that. <clears throat> what is this Uberall business model? What are its basic elements? And what is it that you need to do to switch over? Now, I made a big deal about Uber and these Uber-like companies, these companies that use this sort of a business model. But really, the business model itself is not all of that complicated. Boiled down to its essence, three things comprise this Uber-like business model. And the first is a personal service. Uber itself is a personal service of drivers. Fly cleaners, an example I showed you, is a personal service of washing your clothes. Now, <clears throat> you may be in a products and goods category, and so you might think this doesn't affect you. But remember, these companies want to substitute their service for your product. Not to mention that in a sluggish economy, it is the on-demand services that are showing the breakout growth, while everything else is slowing down or growing more slowly. Service value matters, even to products and goods brands. The second element of this model is availability on demand. Mobile apps, of course, have revolutionized this and have given rise to a lot of the startups we see. But as we'll discuss in a minute, it's not just about mobile apps per se. And finally, it is pricing by usage. Or to put it another way, it is availability on demand that is priced to demand. This means strategic pricing that charges for value delivered in the moment. This is a platform for both affordable pricing and premium pricing, thus unlocking otherwise hidden opportunities for value-added offerings. Now, beyond these three things, there are a lot of other things that have been mentioned about Uber and Uber-like companies. And it's a long list. You know, automated and embedded credit payment, a preset tip, GPS map location tracking for Uber, ratings of drivers by passengers, and ratings of passengers by drivers, collaborative sharing of unused resources, amateurs as well as professionals doing the driving, direct contact information, omni-channel customer service, you name it, there's lots more. But these other things are enhancements, not essentials. The core of the business model is the three things you see here. Simple as that and as complicated as that. So let's take a closer look at each one. <clears throat> and let's start with personal service. The concept at work here is the idea of conversion. If what you're working with is not a service right now, it needs to be converted into one. This is to say that the value associated with it needs to be realized through a service attached to it or associated with it. For Uber, idle assets are converted from non-use to use. Products and goods brands must add a service or find a service in which to get embedded. Products have to act like services. The value of the products has to be more than the product itself. And services themselves will grow as they become substitutes for products, thus converting an aspect of themselves in the minds and consideration sets of consumers. The short phrase for this element of the business model is here at the bottom, from one use to another, from one use to another, this idea of conversion. And then along with that, the next element is on demand. This is about the availability of the benefit itself. The benefit needs to be provided immediately. The benefit needs to be provided right then and there. Speed, convenience, immediacy are the operative concepts. Now, mobile apps have been central to this in recent years, but it's really about fulfillment immediately in whatever way is fastest. The short phrase for this is that we are moving from a go-to marketplace, where consumers had to go to some place to get the benefit, to a come-to marketplace, where the benefit or service comes directly to consumers and immediately so at that. And the final element 
is pricing. More specifically, pricing by usage. Now, this is the most misunderstood piece of the Uber All business model, largely because many of the new on-demand mobile services charge a premium. But premium pricing is not the essence of it. The essence is pay-as-you-go. It is pricing for usage rather than pricing for ownership. The typical pricing approach today is based on accumulation, not usage or demand in the moment. It's stocking up or subscribing or collecting. That's pricing by accumulation, not pricing by usage. With Uber All, you sell it by the slice. No more than I need in the moment. And this, critically, this puts occasions at the center of the Uber All value equation. Not people, not segments, not products, occasions. Most occasions will be ordinary, so pricing will have to be cheap, as noted at the bottom here, from flat rates that are the same, no matter the occasion, to tiered rates that better match the demand on each occasion. Uber calls its premium pricing surge pricing. But note, there are no surge consumers. There are no surge car drivers or special surge cars. There are just surge occasions for which surge pricing applies to all consumers. <clears throat> now, this business model and these three elements are being leveraged in many ways across an expanding set of categories. Let me just show you a few of my favorite examples. Breather is a service that uses on-demand uh, access to find spaces in which people can be more productive, whether a smart workspace or a fun play space or simply an inspiring, striking place to relax. It's actually a first step in, re in real estate. So home builders, office designers, and landscape architects, take note. Bloom that is flowers on demand and really fast. Flowers, of course, are a product for which delivery is nothing new. But on-demand and immediacy change the game and, frankly, make it even more viable as a cross-category substitute for other gifts and remembrances. Everybody, of course, is aware of Instacart, but think about Instacart a few years from now. Not only will it shake up retail, it will change the ways consumers sort through consideration sets and step through the purchase process. Thus, even as a retailing service, it is going to change the perceived merit of many product brands. Finally, let's not forget what we noted last year. The biggest digital shift since the commercialization of the Internet in the mid-1990s is the ongoing pivot to passive digital, a shift from screens to sensors as the primary interface with technology and soon it will power on-demand services as well. In the UK, Pizza Hut is experimenting with what you see here. It's a digital menu that tracks your eye movements as you scan pizza toppings. Those over which your eye lingers an extra millisecond or two are immediately selected for your order. As the saying goes, it happens in the blink of an eye. Passive digital is parsing demand so that in the future, an Uber-like delivery system can get it to you as fast as possible. That's the future. But just to recap, Uberization is a three-legged stool. The first stool is about your proposition. You have to anchor value in a service. That's where strong value growth is being realized in the marketplace today. If you're a product, wrap it in something more. If you're a service, innovate to make it better. The second leg is about performance. Robert Woodruff, the legendary Robert Woodruff, built Coca-Cola around his vision of putting a bottle of Coke within, quote unquote, an arm's reach of desire. That was tough. But today's imperative is tougher. And you might say it like this. It needs to be no farther away than the firing of a neuron. And the third leg is usage-based pricing. Talked about that already. We'll talk about it a little more in a second. Altogether, these three elements will put your brands in the driver's seat of the emerging Uberall economy. But we might ask ourselves, what really makes Uberall 
such a tight fit with today's marketplace. We've talked about this a little already, but let me offer you four additional thoughts about what makes this business model so appropriate for the economy ahead. First, when it comes to value, service is where all the action is. In our US Monitor research, 7 in 10 agree that when service fails, the product cannot save the day. Value resides in service. If I get bad service, I don't care if you have the product I want. I'm gone. So you build a value of product by attaching it to or associating it with service. You build the value of service by innovating the service that you offer. And by the way, this is true globally as well, especially in emerging markets. In every emerging market tracked by our Global Monitor study, the overwhelming majority expressed the intention to spend money in the coming 12 months on services that enhance the quality of their lives. <clears throat> Speaking of which, is a second thought about this tight fit. And that is that the key imperative for service in the future will be immediacy. Now, we know this from watching Amazon. One central element in its growth over the past two decades has been a relentless focus on speed. In 1997, the year it went public, it introduced one click. In 2005, it introduced Amazon Prime with expedited two-day delivery. In 2007, Amazon got into grocery delivery. In 2009, it started doing same-day delivery. In 2011, delivery was enhanced with the Amazon Locker. And then in 2013, Jeff Bezos appeared on 60 Minutes to announce Amazon Prime Air, or drones, to make deliveries within 30 minutes of ordering. Now, there have been some regulatory hurdles, but that's been Amazon's focus. And indeed, not only did Bezos put the world on notice about speed and immediacy, it prompted this internet meme with Homer Simpson whining, 30 minutes, but I want it now. Yes, Homer, Amazon agrees with you. And so it has continued to push the envelope. 2013 saw a partnership with the U.S. Postal Service for Sunday deliveries and news that Amazon had patented anticipatory shopping software to analyze your click stream and forecast whether you're actually going to purchase what you're looking at. If so, Amazon will start shipping that item to you before, before you've actually clicked the button to buy. Better to take the hit to get the item out of logistics if you decide not to buy it than to be slow with delivery when you do decide to buy it. And this year, Amazon partnered with Twitter so that you can put something in your cart directly from your Twitter feed. Prime Pantry is a subscription service that ensures you'll never run out. And Printed Creations is 3D printing that enables you to customize directly. Amazon is creating more value for the goods it sells by wrapping them in a service package focused on delivery that is all about immediacy. But of course, with Amazon, immediacy comes at an upcharge. Not so, though, with Uber. And this is where Uber and other Uber-like companies are leading the way beyond Amazon. Think of it in classic terms like this. As the old adage goes, you can be cheap and fast, quality and fast, or cheap and quality, but not all three. But unlike Amazon, Uber eschews slow. Uber Black, the original service, is quality and fast. Uber SUV, a bit more quality. But Uber X and Uber XL are cheap and fast. Uber is both premium and budget, quality and cheap, but both are fast. With Uber, unlike Amazon, you can get cheap and fast. There is simply no slow option with Uber, not at any price or at any quality. Slow is off limits for Uber. Amazon changed perceptions about fast. Uber is going to change expectations that it either has to be fast or cheap. With Uber all business models, there is no such trade-off. Speed is not the driver of price. Price is driven by occasions. 
Speed is the essence of the offering, the cost of entry, whatever the price. Perhaps the most interesting thing about the Uber business model is the extent to which it fits the future of the labor market. This is my third of four observations. The biggest factor, as we know, changing employment is not economic but technological. Robotics and software are restructuring jobs. Indeed, two technology experts at Oxford made some big headlines when they examined all job categories tracked by the U.S. Commerce Department and using models that compared skills required to the capabilities of computers, they found that nearly half of all jobs today will be displaced over the next decade or so by computers. And broadly speaking, what will be left, those kinds of jobs you see here on the left-hand side of this USAID chart, I'm not going to get into all this detail here, you can look at the link later, but broadly speaking, what will be left will either be jobs running technology or personal service jobs in which people sell those services to the people who have jobs running the technology. Middle management will be gone. No more. Indeed, this bifurcation of the labor market was the subject of a 2013 book by George Mason University economist Tyler Cohen. What I believe was the best book of 2013 and a book that I highly recommend to you. Because an average is over, Cohen noted that the source of inequality in the future won't be anything to do with economics or finance. It will all be about technology. And there's no need to dwell on it here. You can see some of the remarks that Tyler Cohen made in his book. It is only to take note that this is where we're headed, something that Cohen outlines at length. Now what's interesting is that Uber is exactly this intersection of tech and personal services. It is built on precisely the distribution of job skills that will be present in a labor market remade by computers. Uber is run by people who manage the technology, and Uber is delivered by people selling their personal services to and through a company that is run by people managing the technology. This is high tech and personal services. Uber is on the cutting edge of bringing together these two pools of the labor market. Indeed, in the future, the talent pool will offer tech nerds on the one hand and people skilled in personal services on the other. Your business will have to draw from these two types of human resources. Everything else will be done by computers. And today's Uberall ecosystem of startup companies shows how to do that. They are, as I say here in this headline, the perfect analog to future labor markets. And by the way, just for fun, it's likely that we'll see ever more innovative personal services in the bifurcated labor market ahead. <laughs> like this woman in Portland, Oregon, who made international headlines after opening her storefront cuddling studio. Yes, I said cuddling. For a buck an hour, she will give you a professional service of cuddling, conversation, stroking, spooning, and hugging. No computer can do this. It's a personal service on the cutting edge of tomorrow that I'm sure pretty soon will be available on demand through an app that will charge you surge pricing for those moments when there's big demand for cuddling. Personal services, perfect analog. Finally, these four thoughts. Uberall is the right match for household budgets. Simply put, the economic trends discussed earlier mean that the finances of the average household are in a bind. People are being squeezed, the middle class in particular. This infographic from a recent report by the Center for American Progress puts it in stark perspective. Over the last 15 years, the foundational elements of middle class security now cost, on average, $10,000 more than they used to. Yet household income, as you see in this chart, is basically the same. And when all other gains and losses are sorted out, that translates into $5,500 less to spend on everything else. It's no surprise that consumers are economizing. 
especially when you consider that things like media, cable, phones, and technology cost more than ever. Simply, consumers can no longer spend the way they used to, which is why Uber-style offerings are so attractive. Pay-as-you-go may be pricier in the long run, but it is cheaper in the moment. And that matters more when it's harder than ever to get from paycheck to paycheck. For your brands, it's a shift from consumers buying to have things on hand to consumers buying only as needed. And this means that consideration sets will no longer be about what works just as well or just like your brands, but what is available just as quickly or more quickly than your brands. In other words, consideration sets move from performance to timeliness. Now, it's worth noting that payment on demand at specific occasions is already familiar to consumers. The best known instance of this in the digital age is iTunes. Steve Jobs famously pioneered the 99 cent song. Don't own the album, don't buy the album, just the song you want. <clears throat> this concept of only what you want or paying for usage rather than ownership or accumulation is moving now from virtual goods and services to physical goods and services. In another slide I borrowed from Shervin Peshavar, the early Uber investor, you see many of the startups using the Uber business model to make this shift. And the greater impact of this, of course, is in pricing. So my final thought here is that perhaps the most important element of the Uber all business model is related to this element of pricing. It is about unlocking value-added pricing opportunities in an otherwise sluggish economy. Now, traditionally, we look for value-added premium markets by targeting people who can afford to trade up. Now, obviously, I'm overgeneralizing, but not unfairly so. The point is that this traditional focus is harder than ever because the global economy is making people like this fewer and farther between, especially the aspirational middle class willing and able to trade up to luxury. But the overall focus is not on people like this, it is on occasions. It is on occasions where people of all means are price indifferent. The objective is to target moments when price sensitivity is not a factor, occasions that are so special or so critical that people of every means, high and low, are indifferent to price. They want the service in that moment, and it's worth it on that occasion. Now this is not to say that price doesn't matter, but in every tier there are premium occasions. These so-called surge occasions are the value peaks available within an otherwise slow-moving economy. These are niches of opportunity unlocked by the focus on occasions that is part and parcel of paying by usage. These key elements of the overall economy not only fit better with the tight budgets of most consumers, they unlock value-added premium opportunities where even hard-pressed consumers will trade up on that occasion. So just to wrap up, how then should we plan ahead in the midst of this confluence of a lagging global economy and an exploding overall economy? Three very quick closing thoughts. The imperative is to Uberize your business and brands. Maybe to adopt this as a business model yourself, but at the very least, to protect yourself. <clears throat> so focus first on service. And ask yourself, what is the future of service? Where is service headed? What types of service have potential? What formats seem promising? You should array the scenarios and know your response, whether offensive or defensive. And frankly, let us help you do that. Diagnosing and foreseeing future possibilities is one of our core specialties. Second, focus on immediacy. In particular, understand which trends are changing expectations about speed and how this plays out relative to reengineering your infrastructure. You've heard us talk in years past about things like headspace. So how do trends like that affect perceptions of speed and immediacy in your categories? How does it change 
what consumers in your categories want in terms of speed and immediacy. And finally, dig deeper into occasions because that's what is shaping pricing. And in this regard, let me offer this thought. I talked about the overall business model opening up high and low value opportunities. This is on trend with a consumer marketplace that is also headed high and low. Now, frankly, there is a misunderstanding that scarcity of time and money just pushes people to the lowest possible thing, the lowest possible price, or the lowest possible quality. In fact, it also pushes them high. When there's only a little time or money to go around, spending it on something average is just as big a waste as overspending on something bad, because neither offers full value for the scarce minute or dollar. And what we see in our research is that people will spend less on many things in order to pay the premium on a few things. They want a lot from every minute and every dollar, not just quantity, but quality too, which is to say they want superstar just as much as super sale. And in this situation, you want a business model platform that opens your brands to both. And the Uber all business model does just that. And by the way, when it comes to studying occasions, we've been working with TNS and the digital team at Burson Marsteller as part of the broader Cantar partnership with Twitter to segment conversations in the Twitter sphere in real time in order to identify moments where brands can credibly and appropriately connect with consumers. What we, we call this the segmentation of now. And we've done successful pilot work in categories like ice cream and beverages. In fact, Burson Digital has developed an app to do it interactively in real time. And I mention this because this is the sort of thing you should be doing too. If not with us, then with someone. Because in today's marketplace, occasions are the keystone. Nothing matters more. And with that, let me bring this year's Future View 2015 to a close. We thank you for your time and your interest. Be sure to link here at the link at the bottom left if you'd like a copy of this deck or a replay. And we look forward to following up with you at your convenience. Thank you very much.